Okay, I'm trying to set my shot up. Move the chair, please. Bear with me just about 10 seconds. All right. Good afternoon or good morning to wherever you may be Zooming in from. I'm Rachel Messerich, Programs Manager, Legacy and Editorial for the American Craft Council and the coordinator behind the American Craft Forums series. I'm so pleased to welcome you all to this American Craft Forums program in association with our quarterly magazine, American Craft. I'm speaking to you today from my home in Apple Valley, Minnesota, and representing the offices of the American Craft Council in Minneapolis, which are both located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of the Dakota and Ojibwe people. This place carries a complicated and layered history. In the thousands of years the Dakota and Ojibwe people have been in relationship and kinship with the land here, and in the several hundred years since European settlers colonized the land that the state of Minnesota now occupies, the United States land seizure was a project of destruction that denied the Dakota and Ojibwe free and unhindered access to land that fundamentally shapes their identity and lives. We pay tribute to the Dakota and Ojibwe and invite you to consider the land on which you live and the confluence of legacies that bring you to stand where you are, particularly through critical reflection and conversation with your own community. Fostering conversation and community are at the heart of ACC's mission, and American Craft serves as one of the most vital contributions in service to this mission, and hopefully to the field of craft and American culture. ACC's 80 plus year old publication contributes to the craft conversation by shining a light on the diversity, resilience, beauty, and impact of American craft and its makers. In 2024, we look at craft through the lens of four themes, light, ritual, savor, and weave. The editorial team is just wrapping up the spring issue, Ritual, which will be hitting mailboxes in mid-February. Sorry about that. Uh, plans are well underway for the summer 2024 issue on savor. We encourage pitches and submissions from our community and have more information on the rest of the 2024 themes on our website. Please check under writer's guidelines and submissions for more information. Before I dive into the program and my introduction, I also just wanted to thank the ACC staff, particularly our executive director, Andrea Specht, our uber talented editorial team, our amazing marketing team, and our Director of Finance and Administration, Tracy Lamperty, who is taking the behind the scenes tech helm for today's program. The American Craft Council is a national nonprofit member-based organization. As such, I would like to give a big shout out to our donors and members who make programs like this possible. And a very special thank you to the Minnesota State Arts Board and Wingate Charitable Foundation for their generous support. A few technical and logistical reminders, please make sure that your camera is off and your audio is muted for the program and conversation. We encourage you to participate in the talk via the chat feature and drop any comments or questions there. Closed captioning is available during this program. On the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a CC symbol. Clicking that button will turn this feature on and off. This program will also be recorded and available for future viewing. In the winter issue, which you can see here, it's beautiful, uh, we explored the theme of light, a word that evokes illumination, but also a sense of weight or lack thereof, transparency and life. And what better place to encompass both light and life than New Orleans, Louisiana. NOLA was the subject of our second version of American Craft Magazine's feature story series, The Scene, an opportunity for us to talk with the artists and humans living in different cities all over the country to get to know their place through their eyes and their hands. What makes the city special? What kind of art thrives there? New Orleans did not disappoint. It's a complex and multi-layered city with complicated, messy, beautiful people that gets reflected in a wildly vibrant and vivacious art scene. There is an energy that exists there like few places in the country. The art, the craft seems to burst forth from behind gallery and museum walls to strut its stuff in the streets. As New Orleans native Charles Duvernay puts it, it comes to life. There's a flamboyancy, a freedom, a passion, a verve to the vibe that lives in the artists that call this place home. 
And we are so excited to hear from a few of them today to talk about the joys and hardships of living in a place with so much history, culture, and individuality. A quick speaker update before I introduce our moderator. Unfortunately, Charles DuVernay is experiencing a pretty significant family emergency today and is unable to attend the program. While we will miss Charles' perspective in this conversation, our thoughts and support are with him and his family. And ever onward. To help guide us and our speakers through this conversation on the vibrant and vivacious NOLA arts community, I'd like to introduce our incredible moderator, ceramist and educator, Mapo Kinord, who will in turn be sharing about her own work and background before handing it over to each of our other speakers for brief self-introductions. Mapo, I invite you to turn on your camera now. Um, Mapo Kinord grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and began her clay commitment in a Quaker high school arts program in Cleveland. Mapo apprenticed with several production potters before receiving a BFA from the Massachusetts College of Art and MFA from the Ohio State University. Moving to New Orleans in 1994, Mapo is now Professor of Art and Chair of Art and Performance Studies at Xavier um, University of Louisiana. Mapo has taught workshops at Haystack Mountain School of Crafts, Penland School of Crafts, and Matsu Japan. Mapo continues to create sculpture, fund functional ceramics, excuse me, and works on a variety, wide variety of community art projects. Thank you so much, Mapo, and thanks again to all of you. Um, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you so much for for spotlighting, you know, to me, one of the greatest cities in the world, <laughs> New Orleans. I moved here. I'm a transplant, although uh, this year I'm celebrating my 30th year in New Orleans, and it is an incredible place to live. And I have been um, honored by them accepting me, although I do have roots here. My father uh, and my father and his and my grandmother actually are from New Orleans and he grew up in Mobile and went to Tuskegee, but spent a good amount of time here in New Orleans. And so it's almost like it's in my blood. Um, to give you a sort of a quick introduction to me and my work, I started off as a ceramic artist um, doing pots. And so craft is at the center of what I do. Um, both of the you know funct functional work is is what my heart is in so literally getting my hands in clay has been um has been at the heart of my life um you know oftentimes when when parents i teach at a university and you know we're like hey be an art major and they're like but you're gonna not have a job and it's like that's so not true at least it hasn't been for me crafts has given me a lifetime of work to do um, next slide, please. So I have been influenced by a number of different artists, uh, some from New Orleans and some from outside of New Orleans. I was uh, able to work with an artist um, from Jamaica and uh, Jean Pearson, who influenced me to do to do figurative work, and also John T. Scott, who is a very important artist here in New Orleans. And so sitting in one of his classes, I was able to explore doing more functional work. And so, I mean, more sculptural work and investigating my what I have to say. So uh, for, for me, play has given me a number of different areas to explore. And as I, as I started off as a potter, I also wanted to be able to say, uh, to make artwork that was about me. And after going to Catholic school for... <laughs> a number of years, the idea of altars and altar space and a space of ritual uh, was important. So I started a series called the Shrine Series, and these are uh, examples of those, those early works in the 90s. Um, and like a vessel, you know, the interior where it is where it gets its importance. And you sort of have to like stick your head inside of the work to be able to explore what it's about. And in this particular work, it's um, the family that I got to know in Northern Ghana. And so making those connections between Africa and the United States and, and clay working has been very important for me. Um, let's see if you can. So um, because I've, you know, I've, 
I want to sort of use these shrines as a way of expressing myself. I also use photography and poetry. I get to be all of those things when I make my work. Uh, and because my dad was a, a technical artist, he was able to, you know, instill in me a love for drawing. So I grew up drawing both, you know, um, representational style and and non. So abstraction and and representation has been a part of my my history as an artist as well. When I came to New Orleans, though, uh, I got influenced by another artist, Martin Payton, who was very who grew up in New Orleans, in, in New Orleans, and feeling the whole um, dynamic of improvisation. And so I started a series of work that was based on improvisations. And so these forms came out of that. So they really have, the, this series has its roots in New Orleans. And so again, I'm playing around with improvis improvisational shapes and incorporating my love of drawing. So it's sort of like, how can I, you know, and that's the thing about New Orleans. It's like, let's put it all together. It is a gumbo. You use all your influences and put them together so that you can be expressive um, in ways that you want to. Um, this was another a part of that series and this idea of dancing, you know, which is really a part of the New Orleans aesthetic. Well, growing up even in Ohio and <laughs> Cleveland, the other chocolate city, um, dance and, and movement. And so with these works is sort of a celebration of that aesthetic as well. Um, my current work is again, I'm putting together all of those things. You know, I'm still making um, work. Uh, the work on the right is a, a work again of the Shrine series. That series is still going. And this particular piece is a celebration of my family, my mom and my dad and my sisters. And the other piece on the left was actually uh, a commission through a, a great group called Yaya, Young Aspirations, Young Artists. And um, this work came out of a commission um, that I did. And again, so that celebration of sort of movement and uh, improvisation. And I think that might be, that might be it. So unfortunately, um, Charles isn't, isn't here with us today, which is, I, the Black Indian tradition in New Orleans is is one that's just incredibly and fascinating to me and important. Um, again, it's the combination of these traditions. And uh, I think we have we're going to have to share some links and we're going to share some other information that will acquaint you even more with um, this tradition. So um, I'm going to actually head it. I'm going to send the next person on to you, which is Pippin, who I had the the honor of knowing as a as a friend uh, and seeing her work, she is an installation artist, a printmaker, and she lives here in New Orleans and she does large scale work. And if you've read the thing, I'm just going to read it. It's um, her work nav it, uh, navigates and explores issue of climate change and species extinction. And, uh, and the environmental and environmental stewardship. Her prints and installations have been shown widely in New Orleans. And she had a, pro a solo show at the Contemporary uh, Art Center. She's also exhibited uh, at the Contemporary uh, Center in Michigan and Denver and Maine and South Carolina, and Rhode Island, and international sites as well. Um, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Pippin tell you a little bit more about her. She's a fabulous woman. Take it away, Pippin. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rafa. That's awesome. And it's so cool to see. I know your work really well, and I've always been really inspired by it. But there were a few pieces in there I didn't know. So, um, and just so that, I don't know if y'all can capture this, kind of to get the sense of the scale of Mafo's work, but it's massive ceramics. So check it out for sure. Um, so thanks, y'all. I really appreciate um, being invited to be a part of this and uh, to be able to celebrate New Orleans with you all here today. Um, if you don't know it, it's carnival season here. And so it's my favorite time of the year where this combination of everybody continuing what you do throughout the year, which is like, especially if you're an artist, is making work that you love about this place. But then you get to kind of go out and make these like 
momentary expressions that you get to share with the city in these different kind of DIY parades or big parades. And it's a really wonderful time of the year to be in a city uh, like New Orleans. So, so um, uh, get the slide. Thank you. Um, I'm a, I call myself an environmental printmaker. I mostly woodcut and full screen. Um, but I also love that printmaking can be combined, added to, um, and kind of used, uh, make small prints and used in multiples. You can do large. Um, and, uh, and so I like to play around with scale and multiplicity with my printmaking. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so here I am, I was carving a block in the first one. Here I am printing it. On the right, you can see a relief block. Uh, this is of a large cypress tree, which is a local tree that we have here in Louisiana. And it's a relief print. So I'm inking the surface and then I put paper on top of it and use this large press to transfer the ink to the paper. And on the left side, I'm doing an intaglio process where I'm pushing ink into the grooves of glass and then I'll put paper on top of it and run it through an etching press. And then the pressure transfers the ink onto the paper. Um, so that's just to give you an example of a few of the kinds of printmaking I do. So I was born here in Hammond, um, but I actually grew up uh, traveling um, around uh, in Maine and then also in Central and South America with my parents. My dad's a sailor. And I moved here in 2010 and uh, right after the BP oil spill. And I had always been sort of interested in environment and art, but not necessarily together. And the sort of difference between the conversations about what happened with the oil spill here in New Orleans and Louisiana and sort of the impacts of oil and corrects it versus the national conversation about what was happening here was so different that I started really kind of engaging with a lot of environmental people here and going out and exploring the wetlands. Um, next slide. And trying to figure out um, what it was about this place that was just so special and so beautiful and what this ecosystem was that was sort of getting destroyed in these certain, in these disasters, but then also just so, um, uh, I mean, this word gets used a lot, but resilient, um, where it's just this sort of density of species and life that we have here in the wetlands. And so these are two woodcuts. They're both quite large. On the left, 37 by 57. On the right, 37 by 52. I carved them into wood like that cypress you saw. And then um, the black ink transfers onto the paper. And then after it's dried, I watercolor them. So they're all kind of in an addition, but they're also unique with the paint that's applied by hand. Um, and I also like to work a lot with biologists, ornithologists, microbiologists to kind of talk about specific stories of environmental stewardship and conservation. So this is an example of that with the whooping crane, which is the largest bird in North America. It's native to North America and here in Louisiana. And um, by the uh, 1940s, there were only 21 left. And a group of um, different conservation and scientist folks got together and they started wearing these crazy outfits and uh, raising these birds in captivity from from you know like incubating the eggs and then wearing these outfits so the birds wouldn't imprint on the humans that were pretending to be the bird parents and then raising them and releasing them into the wild and now there's more than 800 in the wild here so it is working slowly um the costume is an example of that sort of playing um and here I am out with uh, Dr. Timothy McLean, who is one of the microbiologists I've worked with, and Gary LaFleur. And we would go out in canoes, um, collect water samples of our local bayous, take them back to the lab, put them through the centrifuge, and identify the microorganisms in our waterways that also make up the base of our food chain. And we did this with, um, oh, sorry about that. I guess the image on the left didn't work. But we did this... Um, as part of a residency with a studio in the woods, which is a environmental um, residency program here. If you're interested, you should look it up. It's a great, great residency. And um, we went and identified uh, organisms um, that are in the middle and then turned them into silk screens and then painted the chloroplast to kind of represent, or um, sorry, painted with black light reflective ink where the chloroplasts are so that people could sort of interact with the art and uh, reveal the photosynthesizing elements of the organisms. Um, 
And here's another example of that work, kind of thinking about the, the translucency of a microscope, um, enlarging the microscopic, making it accessible to uh, audiences that don't have access to kind of microscopes and all the technology to kind of see our waterways and then making that visible through the gallery. Um, I also do these series called simulated species extinctions. This is an example of using the multiplicity of printmaking as individual woodpeckers printed, um, carved into wood and printed onto paper and laser cut out, and then turning them into a large show where individuals are invited to remove bird off the wall. And in so doing, um, doing that, deplete the gallery until eventually it empties and the species goes extinct. Um, this is a I rebuild woodpecker, which was um, prominent here in Louisiana and Southern states, um, but when supposedly extinct in the 1940s, although there are a lot of people, if you live here, you've, everybody's met at least one person who's seen one. So, um, <laughs> so debatable, um, but a bird that's captured the hearts of people here, it's called the ghost bird, the Lord God bird, um, and it has a million other nicknames, um, and kind of captures for me the idea of the moments where humans failed and where we had the option and the ability to save a species and we didn't do it. Um, and it's a, an example to use to think about all the opportunities we have right now in this moment in the Anthropocene where we're losing species at an unheard of rate. Um, and what do we each individually do and what responsibility do we have to preserve those species? And this is what it looks like when it's empty once all the birds are gone. It's uh, intentionally interactive for all ages. So um, getting children to engage with these conversations, um, you never know what is gonna strike um, somebody and live with them and encourage them to enter conservation as a pursuit or art, of course. Um, Cause that, as we all know, as, as craft artists, art can be an incredibly powerful tool to engage with all ages at different audiences. Um, I'm going to kind of keep going because I think I'm taking up time. This is another version of that. Oh, I'm sorry. Go back one. Um, that's the, this is about migratory birds coming through Louisiana. These are all native species to Louisiana. And um, uh, people are, again, invited to take a bird. These are silk screens. Um, so they're done uh, between one and five layer silk screens. I worked with do uh, biologists, Dr. Donata Henry and Dr. Jennifer Colson to create this series and to make sure all the information about the migratory paths was correct. Um, and then it also includes information about how they were made and, and why they're kind of important. Uh, and this is here I am silk screening in my studio and then the box of birds ready to go up on a wall. Um, and this is layers. Each one is a hand-drawn layer. Each color gets burned onto a screen, printed one after the other to really kind of give a, a, make them precious. Like I wanted each of these objects, even though there's thousands of birds, to know that each of these birds is precious. Um, and for people to value that art that they get to take home and put on their fridge to encourage conversations about um, these species, about arts and crafts and the power of art, and also, you know, our individual responsibility to be engaged in these issues. Um, more examples, you know, especially if we're here in Louisiana, because we'll talk about it more, but um, we live in a place that needs a lot of help and has a lot, a lot, a lot of beauty and a lot of amazing people and a lot of incredible environmental spaces, but is also a sacrifice zone. Um, and so this is a project I did with Dr. Jordan Karubian, Dr. Hanata Karubian, um, and Studio in the Woods, again, talking about lead and mockingbirds and how it changes their behavioral patterns and using Mardi Gras as the vessel to have that conversation. So here we are again in Mardi Gras season and um, having fun, key, don't wanna just have a bad time during Mardi Gras ever, but also using it as an opportunity to talk about how there's lead in Mardi Gras beads. These beads end up in our catchment basins, they end up in our water supplies. And um, instead offering people handmade throws with mockingbirds on them in exchange for these beads and then recycling them. And we had a lot of fun. Everybody dressed up as mockingbirds. We took to the street with a six foot float and we collected over a thousand tons of Mardi Gras beads. Pounds, sorry, not tons. That would be really impressive. <laughs> 
Um, and I'm going to speed up a little more, but here I am out in the boat with my scope looking at um, the native environment. Um, and then, I'm sorry, yeah. And then uh, uh, this is some of the work that gets made from that. And then so I try to take my own images as much as possible. Um, bald eagles here in Louisiana. Um, we actually almost, I don't know if people know this because it's our national symbol, but we almost lost them. Um, in the 1970s, due to DDT, we were down to only 417 pairs nationally and only between five to seven nests here in Louisiana. Um, now, thanks to the banning of DDT, you see them everywhere. And it's something that I just love when people see a bald eagle and they text me or they shoot me a message and they're like, I saw an eagle. And it's like so cool to be, you know, using art and crafts again to get people to sort of think about species. And then when they see one, they think of me. It's like it always fills me with joy. So um, here I am making some of that series. It was done at Joan Mitchell, which is a great residency program here in New Orleans. And um, it's silkscreen that I'm coloring in with colored pencils. Um, and that's sort of like to show, talk more about it later, but sort of the process of witnessing and sort of collaging that. And this is a new series I'm working on. And it's all about, again, our local ecosystem, um, great great egrets, snowy egrets, palmettos. Um, and uh, this will be up at the Oro O'Keefe Museum next July. And then for anyone who's local, I have an opening tonight with a group of amazing students from uh, Southeastern University, Louisiana University on the North Shore in Hammond. I have three installations on display that open evening, um, five to seven. And there's also, like I said, the group of environmental arts students that are displaying alongside me and um, a few other visiting artists. So thank you all so much. I'm going to turn it over to Jeff uh, Pori. Can't wait to hear you talk about the amazing um, plaster and master crafting. I think you were saying you're a fourth or fifth generation New Orleans master plasterer. Um, and y'all are going to really enjoy learning about this incredible art form that we have here. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Hello, I'm Jeff Poray. Uh, I, I've certainly enjoyed uh, looking at uh, the work of these two young ladies. This is absolutely astounding to me. So, uh, so anyway, I'm the fifth generation plasterer, so my father said, uh, in New Orleans. That's a photo of me in front of a, a feet blacksmith shop, which uh, is famous here. I replastered it. Um, my pictures are going to run, but I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, New Orleans, where I'm, I'm, of course, I'm born here. Um, we, uh, I've been in the plastering business. This is my 48th year uh, as a craftsman, and like my, uh, oh, my 45th year as a plastering contractor. Um, uh, all the pictures you see in the stuff, I chose photos where we did the work in its entirety. And so everything you're looking at, walls, the ceilings, the moldings, large, all this is our work. Uh, I'm in my shop. Uh, the way the internet is not, the Wi-Fi is not working so good that I can't show you a lot of my uh, showroom behind me. But anyway, uh, we're trying to keep up with the times. We have uh, we have partners in the business with uh, uh, John Hankin with the New Orleans Master Crafts Guild. And John uh, gets us grants to train kids, along with our partner, Dow Reeves, who does fancy ironwork and even iron furniture. So we're trying to keep the, the craft alive in our community uh, here in New Orleans. And uh, we haven't limited success, but we haven't fun in the process of training these young people to pass on this stuff. I've got the knowledge of, uh, for five generations, this is what we spoke about at dinner, plastering techniques and, and uh, different ways to do things, as, as well as the people who work for me, most of them are from uh, plastering families. So it's been fun. We continue to do our work. Uh, most of our work is in, uh, <clears throat> in the old New Orleans areas like the uh, French Quarter, and also in uptown New Orleans where we maintain all these big houses, all this beautiful fancy work uh, that you see is usually 
in the, in the larger homes. And uh, we try to keep up our tradition. Uh, we are uh, locally, we are the maintenance men of local history because we maintain all the, uh, uh, all the old buildings owned by the state of Louisiana. We maintain all the churches for the New Orleans Archdiocese. And, uh, and we're all over the place. We're always doing stuff. So we do new work in old homes, not too many new houses. Uh, because our work is a historic restoration. So everything we work on is 150 to 200 years old. These are hand-painted medallions, by the way, uh, that one of our in-house artists did. Um, but anyway, uh, it's been fun. We're going to continue it. Um, I'm hoping to stay at work uh, maybe three more years. I'm 73 now, but uh, I'm having fun. Whatever, however old that's supposed to be, it's not old yet. So I'm going to keep the show going and uh, and just keep things moving. You know, this is our specialty here. Walls and ceilings so smooth that they glisten. And they're, they're like uh, luminous, as one of my customers said in an article. So we continue to do our work to the best of our ability. And we strive hard to teach these young people how to do such beautiful things. It doesn't come easy. It takes years. It takes three years of an apprenticeship to learn how to do regular plastering for the ornamental work that we specialize in. That takes 10 years, 10 years before you can be left alone to do something like this with or without assistance. So uh, it's not easy, but it's very, very fulfilling. And it feels good to, uh, to drive down the street and look at buildings every day when I pass to see places my father worked, my grandfather worked, and things that I, I continue to do. I work for now, in some cases, the fourth generation of families where we maintain their homes that are still in the family. In one case, uh, we have one customer that, that the family house is 150 years old with the original family. Family is still living in it. So it's it's wonderful to know all these people and to maintain their maintenance and to keep the houses going. So uh, I used to be a big commercial plasterer, but uh, years ago, went back to doing high-end residential. Uh, it's just more fulfilling and I have less competition. So we really try hard, you know? So um, I have something in common with these, with our other two ladies that display their work. Uh, looking at their work, it just felt New orleans -y and everything they discussed, it just uh, really proud, proud to meet and know you guys. So, I mean, this has been interesting. And uh, I don't know how much time I have left because I uh, didn't set a timer, but uh, you can let me know when I'm done. So anyway, uh, we, we only, on a, routinely have eight jobs going at a time and, um, they're usually nice and, and everything is so different and original that it keeps my attention. And I just have no idea when I'm gonna retire because I'm so busy having a good time and work and it's hard work. That's why we say we're going to work, we're not going to fun. But uh, <clears throat> it's been interesting and I'm gonna keep going until uh, for some reason I can't. But I'm hoping that's gonna be quite a while from now. And I'd like to see these young people uh, get finished along the way. So we have some success stories and hoping to create many more. And we're not interested in training an army for ourselves. We want to train people that can work anywhere for any other plastering contractor locally or anywhere in the country for that matter. So uh, anywhere that they need nice things done. And uh, we just want to keep the game going and and keep the tradition alive. And uh, Daryl's doing his iron work and he's constantly training people as are we. So we're having a good time and uh, it's interesting. And I like it, the more artistic it is, uh, the nature of it is, is to be technically ordered to do, but I'm always looking for something new to do to keep my interest and in, uh, keep my attention. So. Uh, I can't wait to get up in the morning and go to work. So I don't know when that's going to end, but 
the day will come when I have other things to do. Uh, I'm a bonsai artist. Uh, I have other interests. Uh, I'm big in the tropical fish. So the day is going to come when I'm just going to have time for that and to go fishing. And uh, But it's been fun. So I enjoyed this uh, opportunity. It's an honor and a pleasure to have been asked to be a participant in uh, in, in such a show. So uh, ladies, I want to thank everybody. And uh, I'll look at my photos now. Uh, we have these ceiling medallions you see on the ceiling. I have over 50 different kinds. I have probably 30 on the wall behind me, but I can't be where you could see them because of the, uh, the Wi-Fi is not working in that area. But uh, let's see what the next photo is going to be. Oh, you might notice how pretty my ceiling is shining. But uh, again, it's been fun. So, uh, okay. Well, thank you all for this opportunity. And I, I guess we're going back to the moderator now. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Pippin, are you gonna you gonna join us as well? Okay. I think I, I yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you can see me. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so this is going to be, you know, for the next few minutes, we're going to have a conversation and um, we want to take uh, questions from the folks out there for us. But I did have a few questions or a few things that I wanted to ask our our participants or, you know, our crew here in terms of what is the biggest connection that your form has to New Orleans. I mean, I think we kind of covered it, you know, in terms of talking about um, uh, the tradition in terms of the architecture, uh, but the forms itself, I noticed in those, in particularly in the ceiling medallions, you had the fruit and you had, you know, it's like, this place is about food. <laughs> So could you tell us, um, Jeff, could you tell us a little bit more about the details of that, of your medallions and how that is related to New Orleans? Well, sure. Uh, these ceiling medallions, this is from Europe. These things were, were an evolution. It evolved in Italy and France where they independently came up with their own designs. And uh, back uh, hundreds of years ago, uh, they used to set the ceiling on fire because they'd lower the chandelier, which was candles, light the candles, then wind it back up, and sometimes set the house on fire. <laughs> but they started making the plaster thicker on the ceiling because plastering plaster is fire rated and can last so long in a fire. Um, so what happened, it, it evolved into these beautiful things, but it originally had to do with not burning the house down. You see, so, so they have all these beautiful things that, uh, that have evolved now. Everything that we have, I didn't invent. I make original reproductions of existing uh, medallions in homes uptown now. We have been paid to make originals that are one of a kind that we'll never ever make again. At least I use the pieces in different contexts rather than not use them, but never again to be seen as the one I was paid to do. So we have a lot of them. We're always getting new ones in. Um, we have to, when we get one in, it takes days to pluck all the paint off them, sand them smooth and make a mold, a urethane rubber mold of an original piece that has been restored perfectly to its original appearance. So we fixed the surface and uh, it's been interesting. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm sorry, I had a little something that made a sound. <laughs> but no, keep well, going. No, that's the answer to that. We got another. I never knew that about the, yeah. you know, about well, the ceiling burning down. Now yeah, that's, mm -hmm. you know. That's an eye over that was an eye opener for me. Well that was um, in Europe. So. That feels like a New Orleans it way is, to so solve a problem. Time they got over. Right? Like make it beautiful to solve a real functional problem. <laughs> exactly. 
it evolved into something nice and at the same time uh electricity got advantage so it's just a uh it's just a beauty mark now <laughs> it, it doesn't really have a function except to have a lot of eye appeal and to have interior <laughs> architecture because uh one thing new orleans has and, and you know this is beautiful wonderful architecture all over the place even the rental properties uh from last century have hardwood floors um they have decorations some of them have the medallions uh we do the big molding things all over the place but everything in new orleans is about architecture so we have uh influence from uh uh with the ironwork and particularly from africa the plastering is mostly italian and french and uh uh, so everything is uh, came to us from Europe. So we make reproductions of everything. And uh, everything that we have in this building is originally maybe over 200 years old. And like I said, we constantly, we're making three new ones now that'll be added to the Ore collection uh, uh, to be uh, reproduced in the future if someone needs uh any one of those, a lot of homes, uh, people will call us out and they'll tell me, I would like the medallion I have in my dining room to be in two more rooms of the house. So we have to take pieces down, clean them, make the molds, cast the pieces, and then install them. So uh, my business is multi-fares. We, uh, we do buildings, interior, ornamental plastering, and smooth walls on my specialty, but we also do stucco on the outside and ornamental uh, work outside. So we're constantly busy and the phone rings eight, 10 times a week. I gotta go out and see things from, we do from small repairs to whole entire houses. So we're always busy and it's always interesting to see something new or to see my old customers I hadn't seen uh, in a couple of years. So, but it, it's been fun, but uh, go ahead. What about you, Pippin? Oh, oh sorry. Uh, about? New Orleans. The oh, New Orleans no, flavor no. of your work. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like uh, I'm, I'm really mesmerized by this conversation about the plaster because I've always wanted to try it my hand at it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, 10 years. That's a serious commitment right there. <laughs> And that's coming from a printmaker. I spent 20 years studying printmaking, but still, like, that's <laughs> you can learn it in a much shorter period of time. Um, but for me, well, it's in uh, the for me, the um, New Orleans really captivated me with the sort of environmental issues and the landscape here. And it's a way to um, both engage with the people in the space in a way that feels uh true to this environment and and louisiana but also it feels like it can be shared elsewhere as a way of uh helping people understand why where we live is so special and also why we need sort of the attention of the the national community um i can use this as my moment to be like there's two big things that i think people should be aware of environmentally here in louisiana there's cp2 which is this uh, venture global lng facility and there's also the carbon capture programs that they're trying to do here and a lot of the like national wildlife management zones like like Morpa, which is this piece behind me is sort of based off of that ecosystem it's um the you know most people know lake pontchartrain but like more pause sort of right next to it slightly smaller lake um and they're trying to do these carbon capture injection um kind of wells underneath all of these amazing ecosystems we have here so so for me most of the time my work is trying to tell these stories to get people to kind of um engage and a lot sometimes they're just a love story to these places you know, as a way of sharing that with others and having great conversations about our, our native species and other species that are here. But sometimes it's also a call to action. So there's sort of a bit of a back and forth. Um, I was really excited, Mopo, when you were talking about gumbo as your sort of a way of like the language of art and craft and sort of in, all the influences that come together to create your gumbo that turns into all of your amazing work. And do you mind talking about well, that? The, the name, the I mean, the name that for 
for New Orleans is Bubancha, which was the was the land of many languages, the land of many people. And so, you know, we we still represent that. You know, we still represent it in terms of, you know, the influences, you know, when when Jeffrey were talking about the ironwork and we had ironwork from Africa and Italy, you know, the casting and the the foraging. And so this place is it has such a blend of traditions that move around. We got some questions that are actually some technical questions yeah. uh, that was really interesting to see because, Jeff, are those, you know, when you make those medallions, do they end up getting handcrafted and then the molds done? So it's like, the or, you know, there are copies, but you when you do original work. We still have to make them the same way the original author made. <laughs> yeah, now a lot of things we get in or missing pieces, and we've either got to figure it out of, or use a, a small photograph or an old photograph, and my artist here in, in, in house uh, will sculpt the missing pieces from clay, we'll make a mold of that, and now we'll have it complete. Because sometimes we only get remnants, and we have to put back together Oh, sorry, he froze, but would we have and research it and then just make it from scratch? You know, so I'm glad to know so you're we never know what we're gonna play. get next. <laughs> so so but, uh, there is clay involved. Like you're you're doing clay and then you do the mold of the clay. So you're not you're not carving plaster. No, no, never. Everything is made if we're missing something or need to make something. It's hand sculpted uh, in clay by Chris Jones, our artist, uh, uh, Eddie, uh, uh, Eddie Ramos, or in fact, Will, who's working in the shop today. Will's uh, constantly making something. Will, would you hold up a piece of that molding right there? I'm gonna show y'all a, a project we're working on right now. This is uh, this is an impression we got out of a house on St. Charles Avenue where the, the finest houses actually are. Thank you, Will. You're making and, molds. Uh, Will is okay. in the process of uh, preparing. This is our copy of the original. So yeah, I think you can see the detail, but it's, this is just a for instance of the things we do. So we got so much. Thanks, Will. Will is, Will is no longer an apprentice. This young man, his grandfather, show you our tradition. Will's grandfather helped to train me. One day he brought his son to work. He says, my son's ready to be a plasterer. So we trained him, okay? And this is the grandson. So he's, Will's, Will is uh, at the top of the food chain, economically and skill-wise. He's quite qualified. He's the future. He's the president right now. And in the future, we're very proud of him. Yeah, he's one of our most productive people, but it's in his blood as well. So uh, very proud of the people we have, you know. So uh, so we're getting there, you know. It's just a, it's an ongoing thing, and uh, he's an ornamental specialist now. So Will manufactures a lot of the stuff. The rest of the team, everybody's out on installations. We make stuff, then we got to go put it up. So everyone else that works in the shop or out in the field installing stuff. So, Will, somebody's got to always be here. We got so much to do uh, that e even on Saturdays, we have to work just to keep up, you know. But, uh, John? Do you so, know that anyway, uh, I have a. The I'm aspect. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, the aspect, since this is American craft, and I've been I've been contemplating a lot about the whole issue of craft, you know, and, and particularly with AI and computers and machines and 3D printers and, you know, there are tools, but we are always going to need, I think, craftsmen, people who make things. And it's and the other thing I was thinking is we it's not that we we need them. We need to be them, <laughs> you know. It's, oh, yeah. it's yeah. if human beings are going to be on this planet, 
they have to feel like they're doing something significant. And to give folks, you know, this meditative process of being creative to enhance somebody else's life visually, I know I think it's underrated, you know, that it gives it gives us. It's not like the world needs it. Um, but the world needs happy people. <laughs> and we're like the happiest people on the planet, I think. You can like create something with your hands and 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 it, it in a way it makes you a little bit immortal. Uh, again, as I mentioned, I drive down the street and I see architectural features that my people made, the friends of our family, because of course all their friends were plasterers, you know, so uh it's wonderful to be a part of something like that. And 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 ladies, your work is gonna be a model because it'll be here when we all gone. So I congratulate y'all on your, uh, your effort and your beautiful work. I, I thought it was absolutely amazing, you know? Um, and, and maybe one day y'all can come over here and add some architectural features uh, to your repertoire. So I hope the day comes when y'all take the time to come for a visit. And I wanna learn a little bit from you and hopefully we can pass a little something on, on to the two of you. So I'll, I'll be looking for that day when you have time, you know. But, uh, but anyway, uh, I think it's time to hear some more uh, from you guys. I think, uh, let's see, rigorous process. One of the things that I think someone also commented about was um, the idea of of our relationship to um, calling attention to different things, and and again, your Pippin, your your relationship to calling attention to the environment that we this is a cohabitive relationship that we live, and how we can be reminded that it's not all about us, you know, which I think is really important. When you think about New Orleans, what are some of the places and and that, you know, for you are are important for us to keep, you know, in that relationship? So I'm going to just mention swamps because that's where I like to spend my time. <laughs> so if y'all come to New Orleans, I highly recommend going out to Morapa. Like Morapa ecosystem, there's little trails you can take. Um, there's also a canoe company, uh, Canoe and Paddle with Byron that will take you out or Lost Lands into that ecosystem via boat. Um, or you can go to Lafitte um, where you can just like walk out there. There's a boardwalk on the on the West Bank. Bayou Sauvage is a really beautiful ecosystem, sort of more marshy um, that you can get out to. Honey Island Swamp, if you want to do a real traditional swamp trip, do Cajun Encounters. Um, I think they're the best, mostly because Honey Island Swamp on the old Pearl River is just gorgeous. Um, and uh, yeah, so those are my spots. What about you? I'm curious. What are your favorites if you were going to list? Uh, I had some pictures and I think we have, we, they asked us to bring some pictures in. So I have got a, a picture of City Park. A lot of times when people come to New Orleans, they head to the French Quarter. And, you know, well, that is an interesting place to visit. To me, it's not the heart. You know, it's not the the heart of the city. And most of the heart of the city is like on the street, you know, your neighborhoods, because we are a culture of neighbors. I mean, you know your neighbors around here. At least I do. <laughs> I do. One of my favorite places is the Botanical Gardens, Um and they have a particular place. Um, if we could go back one, I think it's uh, slide number uh, three. And it's Enrique Alvarez Sculpture Garden. And I actually teach life drawing. So during the pandemic, when we couldn't, <laughs> when it wasn't all that wise to have, you know, uh, someone be our model, we could go outside and draw these sculptures. And Enrique Alvarez um, is a part of that gumbo, this cultural gumbo that we have, who has made like incredible works, if you can go to the next one. And so that's the one thing that they did a really great job with at the Botanical Garden is in, in you know, getting his work and getting that there. And also 
Another place that is uh, incredible or an important place to go is the next one, the Whitney Plantation. And if you can see in this image, there are examples of that craftsmanship that we were talking about. You know, in this case, there's no plaster. It's just all wood, you know, the wood and the evolution of architecture that you'll get to chance to see. Because in the main building, you know, these were the, in some cases, the, the enslaved uh, quarters. And then you had, you know, the houses where you had more elaborate architecture. But all of this stuff was made by, you know, by hands, by people who made things. And the one thing that New Orleans does is that we recognize, you know, this past that is, again, messy, complicated. Um, but we also turn that around. If you could go to the next slide, I think I have an image of uh, the Ma'afa, which is a celebration of that past where every year in Congo Square, we acknowledge all the cultures, all the religious traditions, um, and do a walk from Congo Square, which is an area in New Orleans where uh, people of African descent were allowed uh, allowed to practice their traditional dance and they had their markets. It was the one place you could go on Sunday if you were an enslaved person and have you know, a collaborative experience with folks. And so we acknowledge this past and we celebrate each other in the here and now in this place. So New Orleans has been an important place that brings the past and the present together. You know, a lot of times people want to have amnesia about stuff, but this is, you know, we move forward. And that's the thing that's really important. It's like you acknowledge, acknowledge the past but you move forward in creating an environment where people can celebrate and be their crazy self. I mean, this is, you know, this is a town of uh, freedom. It's like people came here like Tennessee Williams, you know, and other artists who felt like the regular world was too confining and people come here because they can feel that juice you know, the juice of the, you know, the indigenous, the enslaved and people from all over the world who felt this energy from this place. And I don't know if it's the Mississippi River. I don't know if it's, you know, there's just this confluence of energy that is just an incredible to experience. I don't know how, how you guys feel. But I'm gonna let uh, Pippin with you and and Jeff. You wanna well, you wanna expound on that one? Quickly respond to that. I love. Yeah, I I 100 feel that, especially right now. Like I said again, now that we're in carnival, um, and also that tradition of um of supporting each other even when it's hard. I think is like a real Louisiana New Orleans thing. And I just want to call out a couple organizations: um, Rise St. James, Louisiana Bucket Brigade. 350 Louisiana, you know, if there are people you want to look up that are kind of celebrating New Orleans through community action, working together and preserving the spaces we have and, and, um, you know, reflecting on the past of what it is to live here. Um, here, I have a slide. Um, this is the sort of darker side of that, but like maybe slide 15, um, where unfortunately in Louisiana, a lot of the petrochemical industries that have been built here have been built on former plantations. And, and so, you know, something like thinking about the ways that, um, that art can help amplify some of the amazing communities and individuals and organize organizations that are working to keep this place amazing and beautiful. And, and when you like get together as like a practice of, of making art, with other people to help elevate some of these conversations. I think that's where craft can also be like one of the most fulfilling talking about, you know, having a meaningful life. I think engaging with some of these harder truths about our areas and these people that are really working hard to, to keep Louisiana amazing um, and not, not, not ignoring the past, but like bringing it forward and doing everything we can to support each other, to have healthy lives and like wonderful full lives here. Um, but this is, I don't know if y'all have seen this, this actually comes from the Whitney plantation, um, but it's demonstrating um, where uh, along the Mississippi river, which is like kind of our artery, it's our blessing and our curse here in new Orleans. 
um, but it, uh, because of the levee systems that were built, but um, you can sort of see the sort of the kind of developments of both the plantations and the petrochemical and how they overlap in a lot of cases and and the communities um that were formerly enslaved are now being polluted by the petrochemicals along the same areas and and so i think art can be a really um powerful way to engage with some of these you know just this graphic alone right is sort of if i was sort of describing it it'd be kind of hard to um maybe visualize but the graphic helps convey that so um not to darken it before we end but i think uh i don't well, know we have, um we have a we have some more time uh if we want to talk about and jeff i don't know if there's or other organizations that you belong to i think you mentioned the master class the master crafts folks uh there was a there is such a large group of folks who are who are continuing this group. Did you want to talk about that for a second? Jeff? Uh, well, uh, I did mention uh, uh, John Hankin runs the Master Crafts Guild. He's our partner uh, that gets us the grants. And um, we handle the plaster and John also uh, speaks to these young people, help them, give them little life lessons and talks to them about how to manage their money, different things. So he provides uh, a lot to the future of these young people. So uh, it's an ongoing thing. We're gonna uh, continue to strive to get more grants and continue to teach. And we're, we're even uh, considering the idea of maybe in the future, having a school, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, the one thing that I, I believe, I have before we go to train kids, uh, I don't want to just train somebody and then send them on the street. Uh, I'm not going to train a single person that I can't either find a job for them or hire them myself. So part of the training is going to be my job is not only to train, but to make sure that they have a way to make a living. You know, I mean, there's a lot of things you can get trained for. And then next year you're getting trained for something else because you couldn't find a gig. That's a um, gig. that so leads me to another gigs. yeah another organization here in New Orleans that is Yaya Young Aspirations Young Artists and they have a glass studio over there too, where they're you know they had a painting program and it's expanded into some other crafts and now you know some of these young people are are creating amazing work along with another institution called the Material Institute, which is up on, uh, if, if you, <laughs> yeah, the upper nine, which is, um, they are doing some incredible things with teaching young people about sewing and fabrics. And one of the things, one of the things I have on right now is indigo that was, that was actually grown in their garden. So they have actually a garden. So, you know, learning how to grow indigo to make the dyes, to develop that tradition. So, you know, there's a number of different places that have continued that are working with young people. NOCA, another one. Oh yeah. We have NOCA, NOCA's music and, <laughs> and the visual arts. And I teach at Xavier University, and we've had a number of the students that come out of Xavier. Even though it's focused for the sciences, we've got some incredible young people who are making fabulous work and is getting recognized throughout throughout the world. Um, in fact, we have a current exhibition at Xavier with Terrence Osborne, who is he has done almost he's done all the <laughs> posters for. I mean, he's done a number of posters for Jazz Fest and. You know, we have, we've got so many festivals around here, <laughs> so many things to do. It's, it's, if you haven't been to New Orleans, I'm so sorry, but you better come quick. <laughs> this place is, this place you is. You need a remedy. Yeah, you must come. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. No, that's good. That's good. And, and Jeff, where's your favorite places to go in New Orleans? Uh, does that have to do with food or just to, everything? You know, every food really. <laughs> um, well, uh, 
food wise, I'm a frequent flyer to have uh, New Orleans seafood. I love to have a little bit of everybody's gumbo. Uh, uh, and we have a lot of good things to eat here. But there are a lot of tourist attractions. Uh, the quarter is popular, as you mentioned. Now, uh, at City Park, which is uh, one of my favorite venues, we do a lot of work there. And we made a lot of items for the Enrique Alvarez garden. We made the entrance pylons, those big nine foot statues. We copied them off the side of the bridge. Uh, we made other things that he's designed. So City Park is a big part of our life. We do a lot, a lot of maintenance there. We plastered the peristyle, which is that beautiful building, Greek revival building with 37 columns on it. We replastered that after the hurricane. That took a long time. But uh, City Park is great. There's the uh, Museum of Art there, which is, uh, of course, a first class, fabulous, big time museum. That's a good place to, uh, to see. Um, well, let's see. Uh, I'm uptown a lot. So there are a lot of nice things to see, especially just to drive around and see the beautiful architecture. And uh, you don't have to drive too far and you find something nice to eat from, uh, we have a lot of Vietnamese restaurants here, uh, a lot of Creole food restaurants, which is the native food and uh, a lot of sushi restaurants. So there's a lot of nice things here. Uh, we have the symphony, um, uh, the opera guild. So there's, there's a lot of things. There's something here. Actually, there's a lot of things for anyone to see when they come here. A lot of museums. We have the, uh, the state museums that are the, uh, the Presbyter and the Cabildo, um, which houses all the original stuff. I was there. Uh, we, we do maintenance on that. Uh, last year, I got to see Andrew Jackson's uniform and another general in these beautiful uh, plastic cabinets. But to see these men who we thought were be really big men, so he was a really tall man. Before we leave, um, and I'm sorry, uh, we got yeah, a little frozen they here. They weren't big because it, it just seems back then. It... But there's this for everyone here. Yeah. If you're coming to see this place, you won't have a dull moment. Before we leave, because you mentioned the New Orleans Museum of Art, could you could you show slide seven? And, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try and end up with those last few little little slides at the end. Um, before we before we sign off, and the New Orleans Museum of Art and the Ogden Museum of Southern Art has has some incredible artwork, but I would be remiss if I didn't talk about some of my colleagues, one of which is Ron Bechet, who is again inspired by New Orleans and his, I mean, if we, we want to talk about the environment and talking about celebrating, you know, he his his drawings of trees and roots, you know, that is at the heart of, you know, the land itself. And uh, I'm really sorry that, you know, we didn't have Mr. DuVernay, but my other colleague, Shalene Jones, has done a sculpture uh, in Armstrong Park of Tootie, Montana. And so hopefully if you ever come to New Orleans and get a chance to experience the black Indian tradition, the black, the black masking in Indian tradition, her sculpture uh, is an amazing example of some of the suits that they sew. So this beading tradition, that's a combination of Native American and Yoruba West African beading traditions that come together. And uh, at the bottom there is uh, the work of another colleague, um, Jennifer Odoms, who literally takes materials from like, you know, the, the soil itself to create some of her work. So we have a lot of artists around here who are really, you know, continuing the tradition of crafts, but also celebrating this place as, a, as an amazing source. Uh, before I leave the last two little slides, the last eight, nine, and 10, I just want to talk about briefly. We have a group um, that's called the Crescent City Clay Connection. And this is my invitation to folks who were, no matter where you live and no matter what craft you do, 
if you call out the message of saying, hey, let's let's join forces and do stuff, people come. It's like we've got over 65 ceramic artists who say, hey, you know, I would love to join the group. So we've had uh, wood firings and, you know, we they managed to put together a uh, Christmas sale where we're unloading work as a group. And that's an amazing experience. And then the last thing I, uh, the last two things I wanted to just mention is Exhibit B. We got B Mike who took an abandoned building and uh, him and several other artists, and they have they created this amazing event. And so he actually has a studio, another location in New Orleans that you can visit to see some of some of the work that's at, that's come out of there. And then the last thing I want to mention is the very last thing, which is my most favorite thing to do in New Orleans in November, is the Antenna Arts Collective Drawathon, where we literally draw for 24 hours straight, <laughs> which is insane. But uh, this place is just the most amazing place for creativity, you know, and the other element about it is that we work, you know, we work by ourselves, we do our work, but we also do things together, you know, do communal projects and collaborations where you're not, you know, you're not by yourself, you know, in some cases, and you get to celebrate with other folks. You know, it's like the black ending is you're in there making your suit. And then you got St. Joseph's Day, Mardi Gras Day, where you come out and you show your stuff. Um, that's it for the slides. But, you know, again, just commuting with people and celebrating creativity and and learning, you know, sharing our craft. So I- In a parting shot. Yeah. Shalee okay. Jones is someone we know very well. Uh, and Tootie Montana and I, uh, I recently redid the monument that she originally did. She did a bronze statue of A.P. Turo, one of the civil rights attorneys important in our local and national history. Um, and uh, she did the bronze of him. We just redid the whole monument over. We made all the cast stones for it. And then they put back in place her original statue back on top. So we have a new monument with the original beautiful artwork that uh, Shelley did. And also Tootie Montana that she, she did that. Tutti Montana, uh, just for everyone to know, was a Mardi Gras Indian, but his occupation was, he was called a metal lather, which is one of the three treads that encompassed the plastering industry. He was one of the top men of his generation. Uh, my father told me, uh, as great as he was, he got all the technical hard work, but he never got all the credit. So we celebrate him. We started when he was still alive. Now, he came to work for me the last three years of his working life to help us do a project we needed his knowledge for, that he was one of the only two men left in the city that knew how to do such a thing. So uh, we were very close to him. He's gone now, but uh, uh, he trained a lot of young, young people, including his son, Daryl, to be a Mardi Gras engine uh, just last year. But we had a, a, a big celebration for him in the Mint in New Orleans. I got to speak about him, his plastering career. And I'll tell you, they had a lot of people and I think they had like 150 people in the room while we were speaking. And even more than that came after. So uh, it's nice to be able to say that as celebrated as he was as a Mardi Gras Indian, <clears throat> He was uh, loved and, and cherished by, I'm going to say, 600 people in the three treads. Everyone knew him, knew of him, and uh, we were very proud to be able to even to mention his name, you know. And this is all I wanted to say on my way out the door. Thanks, Jeff. And Pippin, did you have some last words you wanted to before we before we turn it over to Rachel? 
I just want to thank everybody for joining us. And um, this was a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, uh, if you're here for Carnival, check out not just the main ones, but check out all the amazing. The other, okay, the last the other thing I love about New Orleans is that everybody has the opportunity to be an artist in the city. It's not, it's like, you know, this time of year, everybody can make a bunch of different outfits. You can do printmaking, you can do, you know, you can make molds and make amazing headdresses. It's an opportunity to be creative. And this is a, a city that just breathes creativity. And if you're here right now, it's a great time to sort of see that in the streets, um, but, or in the houses um, that I can't wait to see Jeff. I'm looking forward to that. So thank you all. Appreciate it. Thanks everyone. And, um, we're gonna send it. We Rachel, you're gonna you're gonna send this out. I am. I am. I'm gonna close us out, y'all. I this conversation was so amazing, and I I have not been to New Orleans, and it's been at the top of my bucket list for a long time. And this just like <laughs> energizes me to be able to get there. Um, I, I so appreciate all of you and your time. I appreciate everybody who was able to stick with us. Um, I know we started a little late, so thanks so much to all of you for joining us. Um, and then just a little um, something to look forward to. The recording, of course, is going to be available on our website. And um, thank you so much to Mapo and to uh, Pippin for also helping me to develop a uh, New Orleans playlist. Um, because that is the one aspect that we didn't get with this um, with this event was the the great music that has come out of New Orleans and continues to come out of New Orleans. So um, stay tuned for that, everybody. And thank you again so much for coming.